slowly start. Um, my name is Pavel Weber, and I'm co-chair with uh, Matthew Valdegin um, of this session. And um, this session is about uh, your score and uh, service management uh, system. Just um, would like to say a few words about um, um, housekeeping. So the session will be recorded uh, and made available afterwards. So please stay muted um, and keep your video off during the presentation. Um, if you would like to ask a question, just unmute. So we don't uh, really introduce any strict rules. Just uh, unmute and um, go ahead with your question. And just take into account that this will be also recorded. And um, say this. Um, I would like to uh, stop sharing my, my screen for now and um, uh, or it is already stopped. Uh, and um, Matt, could you share your screen? So I would like to introduce um, Matthew, uh, who is the uh, co-chair of this session, also a speaker for the first presentation. And uh, Matthew is the service delivery information management team lead at EGI. And since uh, joining EGI Foundation 2015, Matthew has been involved in multiple projects, developing and delivering services. And he has lead, led the EGI Foundation operations team since um, 2017. In the EOSHAP project, he's a leading uh, the Federation Service Management Package. So, Matthew, please. Thank you, ahead. Pavel. Can you uh, see my uh, screen, my slides? Yes. Okay. Okay, so um, I'm going to present the uh, overview and status of the EOSCA service management system. So the um, service management system is a major key exploitable result for the uh, EOS Cub project. Um, it's the definition and implementation of the initial EOSC uh, IT service management system, which includes uh, all of the activities which facilitate service delivery to the customers of the EOSC. Um, the aims of it are uh, promoting customer focus among the service providers and suppliers, aligning the expectations of what can be delivered um, and what is expected to be delivered um, to improve the reputation of EOSC um, and to promote uh, customer satisfaction. Uh, it's also about defining the processes, the procedures and policies in order to uh, achieve repeatability over that service delivery. And it's also to clarify the structure, roles, responsibilities behind the services within the EOSC and ultimately the planning, delivery and operation and control of the hub core services and also to support the exchange um, external services as well. The SMS itself is uh, based on FITSM, which is a, a lightweight standards family for IT service management. It's particularly good as it's uh, suitable for um, IT uh, service providers, really of any type and scale. It's also good for federations. Uh, you can consider EOSC uh, as almost being like a, a federation of federations. It itself contains a number of e infrastructures each one of those can be considered a federation in itself. Uh, FITSM is also freely uh, available and released under Creative Commons license. Um, it's uh, worth noting that the service management system has been developed from scratch as the initial usable EOSC service management system. And throughout the EOSC Hub project, um, there's been a number of internal audits by an expert from outside the project to assess its uh, maturity level and to give us guidance how to further work and mature um, the service management system. Okay, I'm now going to give a, a very brief uh, overview of the service management system and its status. I could easily rattle off a whole day or more discussing the details of the service management system, but unfortunately that's really not possible here. Um, much of the terminology comes from ITIL, which you may be aware of, uh, but I do encourage you to check out the FITSM link, which is available at the top of this uh, page 
for more information about uh, FITSM, especially the nature of the different FITSM processes and what is and isn't included uh, in them. Um, what I've done is I've um, gone through all of these different processes within the SMS and assigned them um, a maturity at this stage uh, of the project, um, and that's via a, a very simple traffic light system. So you'll see in all cases the procedures and policies have been defined, but there are varying levels of the implementation of the different policies from uh, not begun at all, minimum to partial and full uh, implementation. It's also worth uh, mentioning that uh, in, in many cases, the, the implementation is ongoing. It's work that is continuing um, towards the end of this project. We've still got uh, some months left within EOS Hub, and then it will continue as part of uh, EOS Future uh, Work Package uh, 7. So now we'll go and to have a look at a closer look at the different uh, processes, starting with uh, service portfolio management. So I think of SPM as the, the king of the processes. It's absolutely critical to define what the services are that are in scope. And um, within our SMS, we've uh, defined two parts of this. There are the, on the one hand, there's the portfolio of core services, um, of which Pavel will be discussing more um, in the next uh, presentation, and also the externally onboarded exchange uh, services. So workers initially concentrated within the project on defining the exchange portfolio to enable the external services to be onboarded. Happy to report that so far, um, upwards of 273 external services have been added. Um, and this uh, portfolio is now integrated with another project, EOSC Enhance, um, and it's fully ready for uh, EOSC Future. The core portfolio has been somewhat trickier. So the, the core services were defined in the EOSC Hub project uh, description of activities. But we decided that this is really insufficient for the, the future EOSC SMS, which is going to be project independent. So what we did was we uh, did some work to understand how to justify, if you like, their inclusion based on sound business cases uh, for all sort of services of the core portfolio. Now, this is relatively recent work, and its uh, implementation is ongoing for this for all of the different core services. Now we move on to um, a number of other services, so service ordering and customer relationship management. Uh, so um, here, 374 service orders um, have been received, and this is as of September, from 43 different countries within this process, thanks to the procedures defined and the first line uh, rotor for processing these orders. Interesting to note that the vast majority of these orders have been within the EU, but it's also included countries as diverse as the Russian Federation, South Korea, um, and Australia. For the supplier and federation member relationship management process, it's been somewhat of a challenge here to understand who the actual service providers are and who the uh, suppliers are, but we've uh, converged on a way of dealing this within this process. Um, now it's being defined uh, as being scoped to the core service providers. And uh, service level management um, is a, like all processes, has been fully defined as far as its uh, procedures, but its implementation has been held up by the formal ratification of the services within the core portfolio. And that's why you will see I've given it a red at the moment. That is more work to do for the implementation here. On the next page, we'll have a look at uh, service availability and continuity uh, management uh, so, and uh, uh, capacity management. So these are two operational services which ensure the availability, continuity um, um, and, available, uh, and uh, the capacity of the, the services um, at the required level. Now, both of these are fully implemented, uh, but it's been quite difficult within these uh, processes to interact with the multiple partners um, and to understand the best way of integrating these services to the multitude of external service management systems to avoid duplication. So these I've noticed as challenges here, which apply to both of these processes. The next uh, one is information security management. So 
ISM is absolutely central to maintaining full trust across the services uh, within EOSC. Um, its pro procedures that have been defined include a number of things, including instant response and also dealing uh, with uh, software vulnerabilities. Um, and its uh, defined policies have included acceptable use policy, also the overall security and operational security uh, for EOSC. Uh, interesting to note that this is scoped mainly for the core services, but it does extend uh, to the exchange as well. Once external services on board, one of the pieces of information that we ask of the service providers is who the contact is uh, for security in case there are any issues that have been uh, uh, we've been made aware of so we can contact very quickly the, the provider of that services. Um, other work to be done here are risk assessments of um, the different services, uh, for example, the service provider portal. And now we move on to um, um, ISRM, uh, which is Instant and Service Request Management. Um, here uh, we've uh, developed a, a new uh, help desk, which is uh, the XGUS uh, service, um, with first and second line support fully defined, um, which uh, uh, does the triage uh, of uh, incident requests and service requests. Um, the uh, problems here is that the implementation has been based on an existing system um, and some of that flexibility has been limited, but as a, a proof of concept, which absolutely works uh, absolutely fine, um, then that does the job. For problem management, uh, the status here uh, is that it has been implemented as part of uh, Confluence. There are some issues here in that the solution uh, doesn't scale very well. It's not uh, easily visible to people outside. Uh, ideally here, a solution would be part of the EOS help desk, and there are plans for this uh, in the future. And now we move on to configuration management um, and change management. So these are two more operational procedures scoped to the EOSC core. Configuration management has been a, uh, a challenging process to create within EOSC, and that's really thanks to the complex and involving uh, nature of the ecosystem. Uh, development of a configuration management uh, day space has been done, and it will be aligned with change management. Change management, on the other hand, um, is fully uh, defined, fully implemented, and it's been in use by the core services for more than a year. And the very last uh, process I'd like to outline is uh, continual service uh, improvement. So continual service improvement um, is the means whereby um, ideas for future uh, um, development can be raised, uh, uh, issues with the service management system um, can be um, uh, registered, and we can look at better ways to actually improve that. Um, this is a fully developed uh, process, fully implemented. Um, and uh, one of the important aspects of this work are the audits that I mentioned earlier on. Uh, two internal audits have already been conducted within the project, and there will be a final SMS internal audit follow-up workshop, which is happening in a few weeks now. Uh, we don't have any challenges uh, here, so this is a fully uh, working process uh, that was uh, uh, set up relatively early in the project. So now moving on uh, to have a look at some of the uh, challenges, um, overall challenges. Well, um, one of the difficulties has been the, the non-static nature of EOSC. Uh, it's been developing in many ways over the course of the EOSC Hub project both within the project and within uh, other projects outside EOS Cub. Um, and there's been a real need, of course, to align the service management system with these other projects. Um, and this has involved um, lots of discussions with these uh, other projects and working groups as well. Another uh, aspect of, uh, of this is the, the highly complex uh, integration of uh, external service management systems and with the service providers and suppliers of these different services. Uh, so uh, from now onwards, we have, as I mentioned, this internal audit uh, covering a number of different processes which we feel would benefit
I've just been asked to unmute myself. I do hope you've heard me so far. We lost you for a few seconds. Yes, for a bit, yeah. Oh, if it's only go a few on. seconds, that's probably on, okay. Mikey, so I can probably uh, uh, do with uh, um, continuing. If you have any questions, then do ask me. So I'm now on to the next steps. I've mentioned the internal follow-up audit, which is happening. Um, and we are also uh, actively in, involved now in preparations for the handover of the service management system to the EOSC future project. Um, and there may be a gap between the end of EOSC Hub and the start of EOSC future. Discussions of this are ongoing, and we're working out how to cope with this gap to enable the continuing uh, service delivery so there is no interruption to the end users. We're also working on uh, documentation explaining the service management system for the benefit of the EOSC uh, future project um, and also um, the ways which we feel are optimal for integration with external service management systems. And I think that that uh, comes to the end of my presentation so um, I'm happy to take any clarification questions now or I think there'll be time at the end of this session to further discuss. Thank you. Thank you, um, Matthew. I'm sorry I was muted. Uh, actually, we could have uh, a few questions already now and um, then um, also discussion after all presentations at the end. Are there any questions to Matt? Okay, um, maybe I, I would like to ask him, and it's not like a discussion between the co-chair, co-chairs, but still um, I'm interested when you say uh, about handover of the SMS, do you anticipate any significant change in the next project like EOS future um, or modification of the SMS, or you think that it will just um, taken over and um, continued as it is now? Yeah, it's a good question, Pavel. Um, my, my expectations and hopes are that there will be no radical changes to the um, procedures um, as they are written in the policies, but I anticipate a lot of developments on the implementation side to make it more streamlined, more optimal. So one thing I didn't mention is that uh, we were really working within the constraints um, of uh, limited uh, very limited resources within the, the project uh, to do the implementation of these processes. Uh, more of a proof of concept and less about scalability. So in some uh, areas, for example, the onboarding of external services, they were quite um, uh, limited in terms of optimization, and we would expect this to be addressed in the next project. But that really is my personal thoughts of course, okay. uh, we'll discuss this in far greater depth in your future. And uh, are there any any other questions? So yes, maybe it. one yeah. question on my side. Hi, um, Hi. Laure Barbeau from Daria Eric. I was wondering if you could already uh, maybe detail a bit what are the challenges you can already see when it comes to the integration with external uh, service management system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, for some of the core services, they are, are delivered uh, by partners within the project, um, and they already have very developed service management systems. Um, so, for example, one of the challenges is with uh, capacity management. So, um, some of the capacity uh, management plans had already been defined as part of this external service management system. We really don't want to reinvent the, the wheel here, so we need to be flexible enough to be able to incorporate work that has already been done within service management systems outside as well. And where the links are there, we need to make sure that they are, are very clear, uh, the interfaces between our SMS and the external ones. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? I guess this is not the case. 
So then with you then, Pavel. I think we move to my presentation. I try to be short. So um, just to remind you that we have basically um, three presentations today. One of them is mine about uh, um, core services. After that, um, Deborah will present her <clears throat> order management and uh, um, the final will be about help desk. So I'm gonna talk about uh, EOS core services um, and uh, we'll start with some definitions um, um, of the main <clears throat> uh, terms. So the EOS core is basically a framework as we understand, which provides the meaning, meanings for to discovery, um, uh, share access and reuse data and services in the federated EOSC system. In this EOSC core, we have a few core services which guarantee the operations of the EOSC and um, support the integration of the generic thematic services and also um, <clears throat> support them uh, 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 onboarded services uh, in the ecosystem. So by supporting them, I mean they also can be integrated with any onboarded, onboarded service. Um, the core services provide um, interfaces for integration uh, of the thematic services and um, um, also allow communities and users to exploit the EOS capabilities. Um, they also provide the benefits um, for the EOS providers uh, in offering their services uh, to make them discoverable, accessible, and um, also provide the support like uh, integration into EOS monitoring <coughs> uh, could deliver some uh, performance um, insights for the EOS providers. And uh, core services also support the federation, federated service management system and distributed operations uh, um, by automation of the SMS procedures and uh, developed uh, workflows following the SMS policies, which is uh, in quite important, especially security and uh, privacy policies developed in the uh, uh, SMS. So now I would like just to, to mention very ma major core services in the <clears throat> uh, in the uh, system we, we are working on. So uh, we have EOS portal uh, with resource catalogs, which was already uh, mentioned uh, in the morning session today. This is like an entry point for uh, providers and users um, for discovery and uh, accessing the other resources uh, of the EOSC. Uh, of course, authentication authorization for structure, which, which enables the access uh, to these uh, resources. We have monitoring system, which provides uh, availability, reliability information um, by means of reports and uh, accounting information, which uh, supports the capacity management process of the SMS and uh, delivers the usage statistics for uh, mostly hardware resources like storage and computing resources. Um, help desk, another core service supporting the users uh, with their requests and questions. We developed service portfolio management tools uh, to enable them for local communities uh, who would like to implement uh, their portfolio management uh, for their tools and their catalogs and connect them to the EOSC uh, system. We have software and app repositories and messaging uh, service um, to enable easy integration between different uh, uh, core components of the EOSC system. So I will um, um, describe a few major services uh, in the core and uh, starting with the EOSC portal. So all things which I provide here is basically uh, already implemented and in production and uh, uh, they're basically available for users and providers. Uh, so for EOS portal, EOS portal basically provides uh, a few things. Uh, uh, as I said, it's an entry point to, for, uh, to EOSC services and resources, uh, and uh, it enables discovery, sharing, onboarding, and ordering of the EOSC resources for the end users and providers. It supports uh, 
SMS process like uh, service order and customer relationship and uh, service portfolio man management. Um, just to give you a, a few more um, insights, um, I would like um, to show you this diagram, which uh, basically provides uh, the complexity of this service. And um, you see here multiple blocks. Um, the yellow block is the service. Um, we have uh, providers in the uh, blue boxes, uh, owners and uh, functional components. Um, what you see here, so that there are two, three major user component, uh, th three major components of the EOS portal. Um, it's a user component, which is um, also known as a marketplace with underlying technology. We have a provider component, which is the access point for EOS providers to bring their services uh, to onboard it on the EOS and uh, later uh, to publish them in the marketplace. That's why they are connected. And we have a content management system, which basically delivers the web interface I showed in the previous slide. By applying these diagrams to the core services, we try to manage them in the change management and configuration management, describe different components, different um, uh, actors uh, contributing to the service and uh, follow the development of the, of the services. So uh, next major services, uh, authentication authorization infrastructure. Again, this is a very complex and um, um, widely distributed service. Here you see the diagram based on the um, community first approach <clears throat> of the ARC blueprint. Um, this blueprint developed in that was developed in ARC project. And uh, what it does basically a seamless access for the users um, to the EOSC resources um, and uh, management of the users' identities, uh, rights, and roles. And uh, what the system is offering, um, it's offering basically two modes, is the, um, providing the AI as community service for management uh, community identities uh, uh, for the users to access the EOSC resources. On the other hand, it provides an info proxy for providers to integrate their resources in the AI and basically bring um, all, uh, all this burden to the proxy level um, to access the provider resources. So, and uh, we are in the OSHA project, we integrating the main components, the main proxies, which you see here. This is the uh, UW Bito Access, EGI Check In, John uh, Edu Team, and uh, Indigo Yang proxies all together. Uh, harmonizing the policies, um, align. <clears throat> we perform also alignment of the uh, user uh, identities uh, and um, um, roles, so to deliver a uniform and homogeneous layer for authentication and authorization for the user. And uh, uh, the, there is a significant progress uh, we achieved uh, during <clears throat> last year still lots of things to be done in the next uh, projects, but um, one can see that this basically the system is working already now and uh, um, performing the tasks which uh, were promised. The next is the help desk. I will have a separate um, presentation here just to mention that this is the basically support a communication channel for EOS users and providers and uh, it offering basic um, functionality for the users like submission service requests um, um, adding, uh, putting questions um, um, providing the submission form um, which allows to submit the request without um, login without uh, providing credentials um, and it's integrated with AI system and for the providers it offering a ticket management uh, separate um, support unit and multiple integration scenarios for their help desk so mailing list i will talk about it also later it supports the incident service request management process oops and um, 
Uh, here, I also would like to show you the diagram, how this system is implemented. So major components, we have for core component in the middle provided by KIT and uh, two integrated components uh, on the side. So this is the uh, GIGAS, which is EGI help desk uh, integrated with EOS help desk and also UDAT uh, help desk on the right side. And by integration, I mean the, the basically the synchronization of the tickets. So you can open the ticket in the uh, EOS help desk and then the ticket will be propagated to the uh, UDAT or, or GIGAS help desks. And if you change the status in one of them, then the status will be also visible in the central uh, help desk unit. So the, the, the people who don't need to always to, to, to log into the central system, which provides basically distributed approach for the, for the help desk. Um, and the last uh, service I would like to mention is the monitoring. So it offering the um, users and providers unified uh, web UI with UDAT, EGI, UDAT dashboards, uh, availability, reliability reports, um, um, possibility to implement critical alerts, um, um, prop management, um, SLA threshold management, which is um, under development uh, and um, integration for service providers. It supports the availability continuity management process. And um, I would like to um, talk a bit about the integration uh, scenarios. So basically we have three main scenarios for the pro EOS providers to integrate with, uh, with this monitoring service. One is the, um, the first case is the integration of the uh, provider monitoring data. So the provider has some monitoring data, probably also there is a system running uh, already. And uh, what provides I would like to do is just to deliver this, this uh, the status uh, performance data in a given format, and this will be published in the EOS monitoring system. The second case is to add um, um, provider service um, in this monitoring system. Uh, so the provider has to send the topology of the service and uh, um, uh, it will be integrated in the, in the monitoring. And the third uh, um, case is basically um, exploiting, uh, exploiting the OSC monitoring uh, uh, results and data. So provider retrieves the data from the OSC monitoring for, uh, for the internal use. Um, on, uh, outside. So um, to get more information, you can follow the uh, these sources of documentation. We have a wiki page and nicely written handbooks for operation and integration. Um, yes, and this my conclusions. So the OS core design and architecture are being discussed and shaped by multiple EOS bodies. So here just um, provided the major EOS core services and um, EOS Hub delivers a well-defined set of services together with interoperability guidelines, open standards and uh, APIs for EOS core. Um, many functions, many new functions, uh, um, many integration <clears throat> scenarios have been implemented um, uh, to support different requirements of stakeholders. Um, but um, I think still it's important to focus on <clears throat> definition of um, multi-tenant business processes. And by this, I mean um, the process like onboarding or resource ordering where you have uh, multiple actors, uh, multiple roles, uh, multiple services involved. And uh, before starting the architecture uh, of the system, one needs to clearly understand what are the steps uh, who, who does what and how to implement it. And by doing this, I think we can consolidate the effort uh, on further development and shaping of the EOS core. I think that's it. Are there any questions?
Matt? Yes, Pavel. Do you have any questions? Not for me. Anyone in the audience? There's a question in the chat, Pavel. Um, Which is, is where, where do you see the difference between the EOS central catalog and the research infrastructure catalogs from Carl? So, um, yes, uh, uh, this um, a good question. So the central catalog uh, provides basically uh, the list of onboarded services and um, it depends also on the policies. So uh, if you have some service in the uh, research infrastructure catalog and um, the policies are basically synchronized, uh, then you don't expect uh, any difference, but this is not the case. So the, the, and probably um, will never be the case. And this is, I think the difference really in the, in the policies um, between different research infrastructures and the EOS tries to harmonize these policies and uh, uh, technically speaking, because I'm most involved in the technical <clears throat> preparation, technical coordination. Uh, we are talking here about the integration between uh, different catalogs. So we don't want to, to have uh, some central place with a strict policies, rather distributed system where people still can keep their um, special rules for the services, but um, obey also the central rules at a high level. I don't know if I answer this question. Um, can I say a few words on this? Also? So this um, portfolio management tool, so this is basically one single service which is being developed um, in the scope of the EOS Hub project. It provides the possibility for uh, any community to describe uh, and to put the services uh, in this catalog. So it delivers the catalog, which uh, can be used uh, for the service description, for the uh, portfolio management, um, for description of the life cycle of the service. And um, I didn't include it in this presentation, but uh, you can find um, documentation in the VK I provide. You can find the description for this um, tool. And uh, if you have more questions about it, feel free to, to contact me. I also want to say that it's being used by UDAT um, so far. And um, the idea is that the uh, integration of this tool with the um, central catalog um, in the EOS portal will basically allow users not explicitly to put their services in the central catalog, but um, manage them in this local catalog. And uh, as far as it is anyway integrated, the, the people who would like to discover the services while the central catalog, they will see it also uh, there. So we don't need to, to uh, explicitly go to the central catalog. I guess for me, Pavel, my biggest question is what do you expect to happen next within the future EOSC future project uh, with the further development of these core services? Do you expect any uh, big changes? Uh, yes, I expect in actually the improvement of uh, uh, configuration layer. So, and a significant improvement of the con uh, integration of the central catalogs in the EOSC portal with underlying infrastructure. So this uh, EOS portal should become um, uh, um, basically, should become, uh, how to say, it? should include information also from the underlying infrastructure auto in an automatic way. So if the services are changing, if uh, um, the usage, that usage uh, of the resources is changing, it should collect this data automatically in life. So currently, so far, it is just a snapshot of the services which were entered in the, in the list, in the catalog during the onboarding uh, uh, process. But it's not automated in this way that uh, it's basically system aware. And um, this- so I, I more automation, more agility, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Automation of the monitoring of the accounting information integration with um, 
with catalog. Uh, so this is all about integration of different systems. Uh, of course, respecting the uh, needs and uh, requirements from the service providers, because if uh, based on some privacy policies in different countries, uh, someone would don't want to doesn't want to deliver this information. This should be also be possible. So just a very uh, gradual uh, integration of different services from different communities. Any other questions from anyone for Pavel? Okay, I think we can move to uh, our next presentation. Um, Deborah, could you share yeah. the screen? Yeah, sure. I will say a few words about Deborah. So Deborah is project manager at HPC department of Chinika Supercomputing Center. And uh, in EOS Hub, she's a leader of the order and customer management activities. And today she will speak about uh, order management uh, uh, from the user and provider perspective. And maybe she also will show us a few examples. Yeah, Th well, thanks Pavel for, for the introduction. Um, I hope you can see uh, the slides. Um, so uh, as Pavel said, I will uh, go a little bit more in detail uh, on the process related to order management and customer relationship management that uh, Matthew already uh, presented uh, in the first presentation. So um, I will just go briefly on how the user can access the portal and marketplace and the different ways a service can be assessed assessed by uh, users and consequently how, how the requests for these services are handled. And I will then show some statistics just to show you uh, a little bit uh, what's going on now in, in EOSCAP. Um, I will just present a couple of slides to, to set a bit the scene and then I will uh, show live in the marketplace and other tools we use in order management how the, the process works. So uh, as Pavel already mentioned, so the use portal is basically streamlining the communication between the users who are looking for some services to implement their research workflow and the service providers who are putting the, uh, onboarding the service into the catalog and making them available for, for discovery. Um, thanks to the portal, the user can access the services and um, make a request for orderable services, which is then managed through order management process that uh, we mentioned before. Behind the scene, the workflow for handling orders is uh, quite complex, uh, but I don't want to bother you about all the details on how in the back end this uh, is managed. Uh, I prefer to show you live how this uh, works for the users and the providers. So uh, the first thing we have to, to do is to clarify that there are basically three different types of services that are onboarded into the uh, US portal and marketplace, which uh, depend on the choice the provider makes during onboarding on the level of access the service has for the users. So we have open access services, which means that basically uh, the user might need to log in, but the provider does not take any decision on who is allowed or not allowed to make use of the service. Um, or we have services that um, require some approval from the service provider, and this is managed directly via the standard channel of the provider. Or we have services which are orderable via EOS Cub now and EOS Future in the future um, that manage the interaction and the connection between the users and the providers. So I will now show you for these two main categories of services uh, how it works uh, on the uh, marketplace and on the order management side. So just one second that I have to switch my slides. So hope you can see the EOSC uh, portal catalog. So um, as we 
uh, hope you already know uh, this is the central catalog where user can search for different services uh, by domain or by different categories. So we'll just browse through the catalog. And uh, let's suppose that, let, okay, let's suppose we are looking for a data management service. And uh, let's say that we want to share some data. Uh, and we will have the result of our search. We have a set of service, we can pick one. And obviously we will have a set of information related to the service and I hope you can see it, but it already says that the service is open access. So as I mentioned before, I will simply click on the service, uh, decide which type of offer I want. Let's say I'm a researcher and I want just it for a researcher. And the portal will provide me, provide me the direct link to the service where I will be able to log in or register, do whatever is needed to, to make use of the service. So this uh, would be very similar also to for the services which are um, managed directly by the service provider, even if they can be ordered. So there will be simply a link to the service page where instruction are provided to user. But uh, let's say that um, we are interested now in another service, let's say to make some uh, processing of the data. I already know that uh, just for a matter of time that I want to use um, EGI Cloud Compute. Uh, you can see here, this is uh, managed via order request. So I can also here select an offer. And in this case, um, it is reported that this will place an, an order and so a request to access the system. Um, so in this case, as I have to ask to make use of the specific service, a set of information are asked to me on which type this interface will be different from service to service depending on the characteristic. Let's just put something here just to go on. Um, so this is a summary. Uh, the one interesting part that is available into, into the marketplace is this concept of project. So each order should be connected to a project which um, will provide some information about the uh, scientific domain or the, the use scenario that uh, the user has in mind. But most importantly, uh, the um, the project allows the user to make a combined request for different services, even from different providers. And this is, um, I think, one of the most uh, interesting advantages of having the marketplace. You can order different services from different providers, make one request, and then obviously the team will take care also on uh, exploring the integration and uh, possibilities for, for the users to make use of all the services together. So this will send, so I will send my request. Um, this is the request I made. You see it's a new request, so it's not been processed yet. I have the history of my order and I can also contact the uh, service order team to uh, for some information. Let's say I want a clarification, something so I can interact with the team uh, via the, the marketplace. Um, what happens in, in the back end in the meantime, uh, the uh, service order management team is uh, organized in uh, uh, shifters that takes care uh, periodically uh, every two weeks uh, to monitor the situation of the service. And this uh, the service order management back office tool called also Sombo in brief, is the tool that the shifter uh, used to manage the, the request that arrives from the marketplace. Uh, the one that you see here in new status is the one that I just created. Hopefully I can go, sorry, I have to enlarge a bit the window. Yes, yes, okay. So I can take some action. Uh, I now I'm, I'm not anymore the user, I'm, I'm the uh, shifter for order management. So I can um, check all the details of what has been requested by the user, 
also if other orders uh, of other services have been made in the same time. I can check uh, comments and reply to comments so that the user can see it um, into, into the market pages then. Uh, the most important part is that once all the information on the uh, order requests are, are clarified and it's clear what the user wants, I can forward the request directly to the service provider. So I will no, just not to spam any service provider, I will send it to myself. Uh, I will just confirm the numbers. Okay, and send the request. So um, at this point, the provider will receive in the a communication that the uh, there is a request for his own service through the marketplace. Um, the uh, request will look like uh, exactly like this. I'm not waiting just because it takes a couple of minutes for the email to arrive sometimes. Um, and uh, the um, provider can access all the information about the user to get directly in contact with the user if needed, all the information about the required resources or related information of the service. Um, it is possible to see the comment that has been already exchanged between the order team and the users, and also send a message to the uh, order management team if other information are needed that will be recorded into Sombo. But the most important part is that once the request has been checked, and let's say it is okay or not, the service provider can validate or reject the request. This is very important then for the order management because uh, they know the status of the request. And also this will allow to change the status of the ticket of the request into, uh, into the marketplace. So let's now, let's say that the request has been approved just to, to show you how it will look like into the, the marketplace. So you see now the request is being processed. This is the status has changed also in the marketplace for our, all the comments that have been uh, shared with the users. So um, this uh, is really high level uh, how the overall uh, process looks like uh, into the marketplace and into the uh, Sombo tool that we use for order management. Um, just going back just one moment to my slide. So uh, let's give you some numbers just to give you an idea of the of how the um, is the situation now. Um, so basically, uh, we have more or less more than 250 services onboarded into the uh, EOS portal. And let's say 200 of them more or less are either open access or managed by directly by the service provider. And more than 50 are orderable via EOS Cup. And uh, this is a snapshot of the situation as it is now. Obviously, this is continuously evolving. So <laughs> these are not fixed numbers, but um, there are, uh, let's say two thirds of the orders that have been already either approved and ready for use for the services. Uh, some of them are rejected. These normally are cases where uh, the, the user may be, may be made a request just for testing purposes or to understand how the overall process work, but not really or misunderstood the uh, the use of a service and needed some, something else. So sometimes uh, we have to reject the, the request. Um, in terms of uh, some other statistics, uh, on the left side, you can see the number of order we received uh, every month in the last uh, two years. Um, obviously, this is a very discontinued, uh, not homogeneous uh, number of requests. And on the right side, you have the average response time to orders for in each month. So um, I think that the most important part in this context is that from the beginning up to now, what 
we tried to improve a lot in the order management process was to uh, improve the workflow and improve the tools so to be more efficient in replying to the user request, so to decrease uh, as much as possible the, uh, the time uh, to answer to order request. And this, I think we are, we are um, at least improving uh, along the way in this work. Uh, please consider that more or less one third of the orders require some interaction and classification with the user. So this also takes some time and some um, sometimes is spent there to discuss with the users and customer what they really uh, want or to clarify their needs. Uh, just one final slide on what is next. So order management will not end with uh, EOS Club, it will go on in EOS future. Uh, and uh, for sure, this work of streamlining the workflow for order management will, will continue. And there will be for sure a need to improve all, it, more also the communication with the service provider on orders um, and probably to facilitate a better communication also between provider and user uh, without the um, EOS CUB uh, order management team uh, in between as, as it is most of the time now. This is what I had to show you. If there is any question. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah. I, yeah, hi, uh, just one question. A date, yeah, please. Um, yeah, hi. The, um, the graph you just showed with the response times, yeah. was that a uh, time to fulfill the request or just to classify the request in terms of accept Ta or Time to classify the request. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I could make a similar graph with the uh, time to response, but from, um, that is not completely in, in our hands because it's uh, um, if we want yeah. to show the time to fulfill completely the order that would take into account also the time taken by the provider to, to fulfill the order. So Indeed, yes, yeah. yes, understood. Yeah. Although I guess that this is uh, important information that it would be nice to accumulate to get an idea of the response times of the different providers. Yeah, yeah, for sure. We are, we have. I mean, we have the data. It's just not what I'm. I was showing in that slide, but um, for sure, we could, we could make some statistics also on, let's say, reply time from providers. <laughs> um, obviously, it depends also on the complexity of the request because, in sometimes, if the user requests some integration work or customization of the service, it might require more time to 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 fulfill. So it's not just a basic response time, it should take into account a bit also the complexity of the request. Uh, Deborah, um, yeah. I would like also to ask a question. So yeah, please. from what I see, I got a feeling that it's still lots of communication required to fulfill the, the order. Although we spend a lot of time to, to um, automatize many things to make it uh, the communication um, not uh, so complex. And yeah. do you see any room for improvement uh, in future? Do you see any further automation required to, to basically uh, Yeah, I, I think, yeah, thanks for the question, the Pavel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the part that is really still manual at the moment that for sure has room for improvement is uh, the update of status of the different orders. So uh, let's say that the providers validate the request as I just shown, then the shifter should take care of checking the reply and updating the status of the order to approve so that the user knows into the marketplace. So there probably there is room for automation also because I mean, it's, um, it, may be, it, it might be automated a bit so to improve even further the, the, the So to say it a, a bit different, is it a problem of policies or it's a technical problem, a technical problem to improve or what basically um, mm. a barrier is it a, or both? Um, what, what could be the challenge in future? Is the uh, harmonization of the policies or uh, just the technical integration? Uh, I, I think a little bit of both, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, even if I think that probably the 
technical aspect in this moment is not the most challenging. It's just, just a bit of work to be done, but I don't think it's really challenging from the technical implementation. It is probably more on the policy side and agree with the providers what is reasonable to expect from them uh, and which is the best way to, 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 to manage but this. In this yeah. case, we need a better description of this process. Yeah. That's what I mentioned at the SMS level, not in the technical implementation. Yeah. So this comes as next. Uh, this, uh, yeah, we are, we are also a bit working on, and... we are also working with the team on better documentation for both the provider and user on what we expect them to do, how it works. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a work that is ongoing and we hope to-, to And I know this, this. The, policy, yeah. the policies is quite very difficult, especially yeah. many actors are involved to, to harmonize the policies it takes uh, it takes time yeah sometimes months is, uh, policy harmonization is an important piece of work that we've been um dedicating quite a bit of time to within the project um in a way that makes it easier uniform harmonized policies across the board so it makes it easier for users to come in and have uh, just one aup to sign rather than multiple aups across different providers there's a, a question from Carl Presser in the uh, chat. Carl, do you want to unmute your microphone just to uh, clarify the last part of your question? Yeah, thank you, Matthew. Yeah, this is Carl speaking from Switzerland. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, just a question. So very nice presentation, Deborah. Very make, make, make it very clear the steps in the in the management and I like it very much. So I see it, it's very professional. I was just wondering, because maybe I'm, I have a gap there, but just, um, for instance, the EGI example you showed, yeah. I, I kind of imagine that EGI itself also have such forms. And so the question is kind of, uh, where, where are the, the benefits that we have this form? on the marketplace, on the portal, and not that each I itself is hosting the forms for ordering services. If I got correctly, you, your question, I, I think what, uh, so you are meaning that, for, for example, EGI, just to make an example as I use it in my, in my demo, probably as the same request form in their own marketplace or their own channel, is what yeah. you are, and which is yeah. the, the meaning of replicating. Exactly right. Just the advantage, yeah. let's say, or, or disadvantage mm -hmm. of replicating. Yeah, uh, yeah, you are you are completely right, and this applies not only to AGI but also to to other providers like UDART or others that have their own channel for for onboarding users. But um, I think the main uh, advantage to have this replicated into the marketplace is that I can, as a user, uh, request services for uh, multiple providers and or asking multiple services at the same time. Uh, so if I want, as I've quickly shown in my demo today, uh, make use of EGI compute and use that uh, data management service, uh, I can just put one request through the marketplace uh, without having to go to the two different providers, use two different systems. So that I think is the main uh, advantage of uh, of using the marketplace instead of going through the different channels. May I also Very clear. Add a few yeah, words? Please, please, yeah, it's a good question, Carl. And I mean, I think it's really important to appreciate the fact that onboarding to EOSC does not imply exclusivity through EOSC. Yeah. Yeah? So um, what we are doing is we are offering a, an additional avenue for users to order services. We're not saying that you can no longer use your own if you're already part of another federation like uh, EGI or whatever, uh, but it's opening it out to new user bases, which I, I think hopefully uh, will clarify matters a bit. Yeah, thanks, Matthew. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions? not, I guess it's back to you, Pavel. Yeah, right, I just try to share my screen. Uh, so I think, right, so um, yes, um, 
I'm Paul Weber and uh, I'm working at KIT uh, Germany and um, in your sub project I'm coordinating the integration of federation services and um, in this presentation I'm going to talk about help desk um, which we deliver to the EOSC starting with introduction. So the help desk is the entry point for EOSC users to submit incident re uh, report, um, issue a problem or request any information. And um, um, as I already mentioned, help desk um, in the EOSC is the backbone service of the incident and request management process, um, which facilitates the communication between customers uh, and service providers. Um, and um, um, basically allows to manage uh, service requests um, in more or less consistent uh, manner. Um, the picture I already presented in the uh, presentation before, here I just want to say a few words about the status. So the help desk uh, in production and um, it um, also integrated with the portal and uh, marketplace. The web forms um, presented there allow the users to submit the uh, tickets uh, directly from, from that uh, portals. And um, we also define all support units uh, and assign uh, people to, to, um, to them and um, uh, develop uh, interoperability guidelines and um, offerings for communities. So um, here I would like to um, shortly describe the unit structure as we see it in the EOS Hub project. So the zero line uh, support is the self-support where the user tries to get the information from open sources, uh, um, and check the FAQ and uh, training material, different documentation and user guides. Uh, and uh, if uh, he or she fails to do that, then the form will be submitted uh, and this will enter the first level of the EOS hub. And um, depends on the complexity of this um, request, it will be either answered immediately, dispatched to the second level, or to the third level. So the second level basically is the uh, general support level for <clears throat> major uh, questions uh, addressed to the EOSC about the technical um, uh, information, technical, um, technical questions, uh, general questions, uh, for example, how to onboard uh, with the EOSC. Um, and um, it also integrates um, a few help desks, which I mentioned uh, currently, it is EGMU.DAT. If this um, request is assigned to them, then they immediately um, forward it to these help desks and then um, manage them um, in, in these uh, uh, organizations. Um, in case of the um, the question um, needs to be addressed to the um, product teams, to the experts, and uh, requires the technical expertise. It uh, can be forwarded to the third level for your score services. For the other services, we see that the second level basically includes um, the distributed um, uh, and net network of the help desks and support units from the different service providers. So this is the implementation in this is the interface of the help desk uh, with all the support units I described and um, um, the contact points and um, groups of the people uh, responsible. I just um, uh, um, close them for the privacy and um, this shows that basically it is implemented and it's uh, in production. Uh, what I want to talk further, it's about the offering and integration op options for the uh, EOS providers. So we consider three main integration op options. Option. Um, these are direct usage, ticket redirection, and full integration. So by um, 
direct uh, usage, um, basically uh, community um, obtains support unit within the help desk and manages system uh, using the EOS help desk um, as a service. So the ticket uh, redirection option is um, quite simple. The community already has um, its help desk or mailing list and the request just propagated um, uh, through the EOS help desk and they are managed uh, in, at the community level. And the full integration is um, is basically community has the help desk, but uh, would like to integrate with the OSC help desk, and then we um, integrate it um, with better bidirectional synchronization of the tickets uh, between both systems. So these three examples we have uh, basically implemented and um, so far used in the EOSC hub project, and um, we also pr provide them for the future project. We have some challenges um, because based on uh, and requirements. So the current implementation of the help desk uh, and um, uh, integrations I mentioned with other help desks, uh, they, they basically meet the requirements um, to basic help desk system, but um, all these implementations lack flexibility, customization, and uh, this is uh, what we uh, got based on our experience is not easy to scale. So we collected all the requirements to the EOS help desk and uh, the expectations which are um, um, uh, summarized in this list. So uh, the stakeholders um, expecting unified scalable help desk for EOS users and providers, modern and user-friendly interface, framework for linking national thematic institutional help desks, um, self-support knowledge database was mentioned um, many times. Um, um, SLA management um, help desk as a service for communities, which more or less basically also implemented, as I mentioned, and uh, also tested <clears throat> customizable workflows and um, different interfaces to different processes of the service management system. So um, basically we would like to provide the interfaces to the change management, to the problem management, uh, configuration management uh, um, processes and uh, manage all these requests and uh, um, also triggered changes in the system in more automated way. So, and uh, we um, took a decision um, um, after many discussions to uh, change the technology and go with OTRS in the future. And um, we already um, got a prototype for uh, of the system. And um, the current plan is uh, uh, still collection assessment and prioritization of requirements from, stealth, uh, from stakeholders. And next uh, in this uh, new project in the OS future, we'll start multi-step rollout process. So, with main points uh, like preservation of the current best practices and established procedures. All the experience we collected in the EOS Hub project is very valuable and um, also um, in other projects uh, and um, this will be uh, basically preserved and uh, used um, for the further design. Um, we focus on the transparent com communication of any change and um, um, also, any new feature which will be introduced uh, should basically roll back to, on the request from the um, EOS stakeholders. I would like also to say a few words about knowledge database. So, uh, this topic also related to the help desk. And uh, the point is that we have uh, collected lots of nice documentation pages. Um, um, in the portals, in documentation portals, in wiki pages, uh, PDF documents. Um, uh, the problem is that uh, typically users have no time to read all that to find required information. They could, of course, use this information for all these sources if they want <clears throat> just to learn more and um, check training materials. But 
in the daily business, the users just need quick support and they open a ticket or <clears throat> get some, send a mail because they just cannot find the information or there's so many, so much information that they cannot basically figure out what is actually uh, actual now. And um, the knowledge database uh, we consider uh, in the help desk, it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not yet another source of documentation. Uh, instead, uh, we consider it as aggregator and list of structured FAQ and links to the already existing pages. And um, it should also provide the instant <clears throat> possibility to search and access the requested information. Uh, of course, uh, it requires that um, supporting uh, uh, of the different sections in this um, knowledge database by different um, supporting units and um, um, yeah, should be basically assigned uh, to the responsible people um, each section in, the, in this knowledge database to keep it up to date. Okay, before we come to the questions, I would like to also introduce um, this interface uh, which, I'm, which I mentioned in the new system. So uh, you see it on my screen now. So I'm basically locked already. This is the user interface and um, um, here you see some useful links. Uh, then um, there is a search field in the knowledge database and a list of the tickets. So uh, which user open uh, and um, would like to um, uh, basically address to the EOSP. Um, uh, so uh, I also would like to mention there is a possibility of chart. So not only white tickets and if someone um, on the other side, on the provider side, ready to chat and ready to answer the ticket, the user can open the new conversation and directly address the ticket uh, uh, to, to any uh, support unit behind. And it could be that some communities will provide this uh, uh, possibility at some dedicated time uh, or not, but uh, the, the, this possibility is there. So the tickets uh, or the chat history will be stored in the, in the chat and can be also converted to the, uh, to the uh, ticket if it's not answered fully. So this history won't be lost. It's, uh, it's always will be available for user disposal. Another thing I want to mention is the uh, knowledge database. This is just a prototype and um, uh, it's not field, but um, it contains multiple categories. For example, we're starting with the uh, AI documentation and we have different categories for providers and for users. And uh, then when we go to the end users, we have information for B2 access and um, for check-in. And this is our different articles, which basically very short <clears throat> description of the problem and uh, solution. And solution is not uh, provided here, but it's a link to the uh, existing documentation, which is um, up to date and um, um, provided by the service provider. What I want to show is um, that the users of this help desk, they don't want basically to um, scroll all this knowledge database. They just uh, give some uh, um, request in the search field and then they get <clears throat> already um, uh, some related articles and then they, they click on it and uh, go directly to the information about it. So this is um, um, how the search uh, working and uh, if you want to, uh, for example, information about check-in service, then the same um, information just uh, popped up. Um, another point um, is that if you want to open the ticket, you start with a, with a subject and you start, uh, for example, in your subject, <clears throat> you have to check in or some keyword. On the right side, you already see the information which is provided in the knowledge database 
So the users, maybe they, when they start to, <clears throat> to, uh, to name the ticket, then already see the answers and they just go directly to the <clears throat> information provided and uh, get the answer uh, in the documentation. So in this way, uh, this uh, knowledge base will provide uh, quick and useful information uh, for the users. And so even if they don't want to, to search explicitly, they just want to open tickets, but they, they will, they will, this information will be shown on the, on the left side, on the right side of this interface. Okay, that's, I think that's it, what I wanted to present. So that the work is ongoing and uh, you will hear more about it in the next uh, project. And so far I'm ready also for the questions. Thanks, Pavel. A nice taste of what there is to come in the future. Any, uh, we've got a little bit of time before the end of our session uh, for questions. I mean, this is uh, something we put at the end for open discussion. If there are any points that people would like to question or discuss, feel free. One question that I really wanted to ask the um, participants is what they feel of the list of the core services as has been um, developed within the EOS Cub project. Do people think that this um, is the right core services or do they expect or did they expect to see something that we haven't covered? Um, any um, thoughts on this would be interesting for us. take silence as meaning people in agreement of what we've uh, uh, shown. <laughs> Is that the case? Hey, just, just to break the silence, um, it, it seems fairly comprehensive. It seems fairly good. Nothing leapt out to, uh, uh, as in sort of, oh, they missed such and such, or, or indeed, oh, why have they gone for such and such? So, yeah, that's fairly consistent and complete. Thanks, Toby. Any uh, final questions or points from anyone? Maybe yes, just a, a question because you mentioned in the um, EOS core services at the beginning that uh, you were grouping EOS portal and resource catalogs. And there was also this uh, software and app repositories uh, kind of uh, block or brick. Uh, what kind of um, links um, or bridges do you consider between what you call resource catalogs and software and app repositories? Pavel, do you want to take that? Um, I didn't get exactly. Could you, could you just repeat the, the last part of this question? Yeah, sure. At the beginning, in some of the slides uh, where you were uh, listing the different EOS core services, uh, there was this presentation of the EOSC portal grouped with uh, resource catalogs. And in another brick or in another part of this uh, description of the EOS core services, there was also the mention of software and app repositories. So I was wondering if you were uh, considering some kind of uh, bridges between these uh, two blocks of the EOSC services, um, because we can also consider that the software and app repositories is a kind of resource, could be part of a resource catalog, for example. Yeah, I mean, this is uh, what I um... What I showed is this um, um, app, uh, AppDB. This is a, a service provided uh, by EGI, which also enables access to the computing resources and also provide a list, uh, a catalog of the software um, appliances uh, and um, virtual uh, images. And um, of course, this could be a part of the catalog. and. Um, for the, some communities also provide this information. Um, the question is uh, if it will be a core service. So because the services provided by the catalog doesn't mean uh, are included in the core service, the core uh, EOS core, because EOS core, as I mentioned, just uh, some um, framework which uh, enables the EOS. And um, 
this is a, a very complex question. It is discussed uh, in many different uh, uh, groups and um, uh, I think there's no exact answer what will be the part of the core, but for catalog, actually any service could become if it uh, actually um, um, passes all this validation criteria provided in the onboarding process, they, it can become a part of the catalog. But uh, um, to become a catalog, to be part of the catalog doesn't mean that the service become an EOS core. Uh, I don't know if I'm just explain uh, if you get the answer on your question. Yes, some kids, yes, thank you. It is an interesting question along a similar way. Um, we can also think of data as being resource discovered by a data catalog, how we deal with that. I guess it's a, a similar uh, situation as software and other types of resources. I see also a question about the, the uh, help desk, I think, um, from Rich, uh, from Richard. Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Uh, um, this will be, of course, um, possible, and um, all the things we develop will be uh, will become available for testing. And uh, this is uh, absolutely a necessary step to, to proceed. So far, uh, we even haven't started with um, the project. So this help desk will come in the EOS future, and uh, this prototype is just a very very initial step. So we are not ready to provide it for, for, for even for testing, but uh, feel free to, to contact me and to send the requirement. We already collected the requirements from different communities and um, yes, all requirements will be addressed. But um, um, so the answer is yes, um, just um, yeah, we need a little bit more time. It's not that like we uh, put it in, in production and let's uh, say, okay, that's not, now it's done. and. Uh, uh, that's it. So it's a multi-step uh, process uh, with many iterations based on the feedback of the uh, all communities who would like to participate in this endeavor. And with that, I'm afraid we are out of time. So uh, Deborah, Pavel and myself, we hope that this has been a useful session. Um, if you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to contact any of us and we'll very happy to respond. Thank you very much indeed for joining. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, all. Yes, bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.